Hello, and uh, welcome to our conversation today. Uh, today's conversation is about bipartisan leadership. We appreciate you taking time out of your day for this discussion. My name is CJ Deagle. I'm the state leader for Stand Up Republic here in the state of Arizona. Over the past two years, it's been my privilege to be part of this organization founded by Evan McMullen and Mindy Finn. Through this community, I had the opportunity to represent Arizona at a conference in Virginia in February of this year. It was at that conference that I had the honor of getting to know former CIA Director General Michael Hayden and his wife Janine. After one of the sessions, they pulled me aside and asked me what I thought of Mark Kelly. Janine told me, we like Mark. Then she shared with me the story of how Mark Kelly and his wife Gabby Giffords visited General Hayden in the hospital after his stroke. That simple act of kindness made an indelible impact on my views of Mark Kelly and Mark's willingness to set partisanship aside to show his humanity. I'm proud to be a part of the Stand Up Republic community and express my gratitude to my friends, Evan and Mindy, for founding this movement. With that, I'll turn it over to Evan to say a few more words about our mission and organization. Thank you, CJ. I, I so appreciate your leadership in Arizona and, and uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction to this event. And thank you to all who are, are joining us today and, and especially to our special guest, Mark Kelly. Uh, before we get started, as CJ mentioned, I'll, I'll say a few things about our work at Stand Up Republic. Many of you are well aware of it. Others uh, may be joining us for an event for the first time. Um, we are a national organization with members in every state and in every congressional district. Uh, we unite Republicans, Democrats, and, and independents around our foundational American values and in, in defense of our system of self-rule. And uh, we, are, um, we are proud to, to have, as I said, a cross-partisan membership. Many of our members are, are principled and former Republicans or right-leaning independents, uh, but we also have Democrats with us, uh, all united, again, as I say, around our foundational principles. And uh, so, so that's the spirit uh, that, that in which we do our work. Uh, that is, that includes advocacy work in Washington, trying to advance uh, reforms that are essential for, for our system of self-government. Uh, but also uh, we get involved in elections and uh, you know, uh, help uh, unifying leaders uh, uh, prevail and divisive uh, leaders and those who present dangers to our democracy, uh, we help them not prevail. Uh, to put it kindly. Um, and so th that's our work. We also advance uh, electoral and other reforms at the state level around the country. And many of you have been very actively engaged in that work for years now, since the founding of Stand Up Republic in, 20, in 2017. Uh, we thank you for all of your work and uh, for your partnership in these efforts. Um, today, we're, uh, we're so honored to, to be able to hear from Mark Kelly. Mindy Finn, as the Stand Up Republic's co-founder, will, will introduce Mark. Before I do that, I, I want to, um, I guess, to take care of a little bit of housekeeping and in, 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 in just saying that, you know, this is a, a, a conversation that uh, this is not a campaign event uh, consistent with 501c4 regulations. We're a 501c4 organization. Um, this will not be a discussion about uh, about the election in Arizona, about the presidential election uh, specifically. We will not advocate for the election or defeat of anyone, uh, although in other forums, we, we certainly do that. Uh, but in this forum, we're here to talk about uh, unifying cross-partisan, bipartisan leadership um, with uh, a, a man who is um, offering that and to Arizona and, and to the country. And we're eager for that discussion. Uh, Mindy, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, CJ, and, and thank you, Evan. Uh, as, as Evan said, I'm Mindy Finn. I'm the co-founder of Stand Up Republic. And here it's, we're really uh, proud of working in a, in a cross-partisan way. We seek to model the type of cross-partisan collaboration uh, and problem solving and bridge building that we believe the country uh, needs to have, that, that we need to see in uh, our elected leaders in order to get to solving uh, the problems for the American people and to address modern challenges head on. And it's in that spirit of service to the country and putting country over party that we welcome uh, Captain Mark Kelly to this call today. And we're, we're really thrilled to have him as well as all of you who are tuned in. Captain uh, Mark Kelly is a retired US Navy combat pilot. 
engineer and uh, a NASA astronaut. He lives in Tucson with his wife, former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. He's the son of two police officers and um, he you know, went to public school from elementary school through the US Merchant Marine Academy and US Naval Postgraduate School. Later, he made two deployments and flew 39 combat missions in Operation Desert Storm. In 1996, he was selected as an astronaut and he flew four missions aboard the space shuttle before retiring from NASA in 2011. And now uh, Mark is running for the US Senate in Arizona um, and he's on his next mission, which is to represent Arizona in the United States Senate. And you know, I'll just say before turning it over to Mark that uh, we invite him here today because we really appreciate the way that he has kind of dem demonstrated um, again, this, this spirit of working together to, to solve problems and to serve the country. Um, Captain Kelly, Mark, if I can call you that, we're, we're so thrilled to have you today and I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you, Mindy. Thanks for the introduction. And Evan and CJ, thank you so much. General Hayden, I'm a big fan of his um, for, for a long time and it's uh, good to see that he's doing, doing well. Uh, you know, I just wanna say hi to everybody and, um, you know, first off, let me start with, uh, you know, I decided to run for the United States Senate to try to, you know, bring folks together from different backgrounds and different walks of life. Um, but, you know, it's not just about, you know, this election. You know, we've got some significant problems we're facing right now, and we can't solve them in partisan corners. Um, and we're at a really critical and a crucial moment for our country and for the state of Arizona. And I, I, I just think that what we're facing right now as a country is different than anything we faced before. We've got a public health crisis that spurred this really horrible economic crisis. But both of these things have been made worse by a crisis of leadership. And the reality is that, um, that we can't tackle our country's biggest challenges by continuing to retreat into these partisan corners that Washington often finds themselves in. Now, when I was growing up in New Jersey, I did not dream of ever running for elected office. My dream as a little kid was that I dreamt of becoming the first person to walk on the planet Mars. Um, turned out, I didn't make it. Uh, uh, but I did have the opportunity to serve our country in the Navy for 25 years, spent uh, 15 years of that at NASA flying the space shuttle. Uh, but early in my Navy career, I was stationed in the Western Pacific uh, for a while, for nearly three years. And I made a couple deployments on an aircraft carrier. Well, I spent a lot of time on this aircraft carrier, the USS Midway, uh, but on uh, two different occasions uh, deployed to the Arabian Gulf. And I flew uh, 39 combat missions in the first Gulf War. And then I went to grad school, became a test pilot and then an astronaut. And I flew into space four times, twice the last two flights. I was the, uh, had the opportunity to be the commander of the space shuttle, which is a great job. So I did get, you know, I got a little closer to Mars, uh, but like a lot of folks out there, you know, the path for me to achieve my personal goals and my dreams, that was not all, always clear to me. Because when I was growing up, you know, I was I was not the best student, um, especially in elementary school and in middle school. I really struggled, but it was my mother who really inspired me. Because when I was a little kid, my mom she was a secretary and a waitress at the same time. She'd have two jobs to make ends meet, and then she decided to become a police officer like my dad. But this was New Jersey in the 1970s, so it was really hard. And I watched my mother work incredibly hard at this. I mean, so hard, and she was successful, and it really motivated me. And I buckled down in school, and I was eventually able to take my public school education, went off to one of the five uh, federal service academies, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, and then into the Navy, and then eventually uh, was able to get to NASA into the astronaut corps. And it was during my time at NASA that I really learned how to work with and lead people from different backgrounds. Uh, because when you're orbiting the earth at 25 times the speed of sound and a problem comes up, you don't have time to worry about the background of the person offering the solution. You got to figure things out together as a team. And after those experiences, I thought I knew 
you know, a lot about public service. But then I met my wife, my future wife, Gabby. And Gabby showed me a whole different side of public service. She's the one who taught me how you can use public policy to improve people's lives. And right now we're seeing just how important it is that our leaders are focused on the lives of American citizens and how to use the tools at their disposal to, to help people. Now, this pandemic has really pushed our healthcare system, especially to the brink, and it has devastated our economy. And I think all of us feel a lot less certain about what the future for our country is going to look like. So I think we deserve leaders who can figure out a path forward and work in a nonpartisan and independent way to get things done. And, you know, if, if, successful. And if I have the opportunity to serve in the United States Senate, you know, there's a lot I want to focus on. You know, one thing is trying to fix some of the flaws in our healthcare system that have been exposed and made worse by this pandemic. Um, price of prescription drugs are too high. Um, you know, folks are often worried that if they have a pre-existing condition, if they could lose those protections. Uh, and then, but we also have to really think about how we're going to rebuild our economy and come up with a plan that really looks towards the future. And I think that means, you know, really supporting small businesses, but also focusing on science and technology and investing in STEM education and job training, apprenticeships. We've got to give young Americans the skills they need, whether or not they're heading to college or not. And, you know, we've got to do the, the, these things and then we've got to protect, you know, programs that, you know, seniors rely on like social security, you know, and Medicare that is so important for seniors. And, you know, that's, I think that's what it means to be like an independent voice, you know, for Arizona. And we desperately need, you know, some new uh, leadership in Washington. I often think that Washington is broken and it's been broken for some time. So we have an opportunity to tackle some big issues uh, that's so important to our country, you know, figuring out how do we get folks affordable health care, rebuilding the economy with an eye towards the future. And I would like to, if elected, take the opportunity to bring a focus on science and data and facts uh, to Congress. Um, so I'm looking forward to this important conversation we're going to have today. I often see uh, Washington falling short on so many issues. I also, uh, another uh, leader that like you know, General Hayden, another uh, leader that I really respected, uh, my commanding officer and my first squadron in the United States Navy used to tell me all the time, and he, and he was talking about operational stuff and aircraft carrier stuff and flying airplanes. He would say, if you're not changing it, it's getting worse. So change is important. I think we need some of that now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> so Thank you very much for, for sharing that. And in uh, the spirit of, of some of the things you said, we have a couple of questions. And uh, one of those questions uh, comes to us from, uh, from Braden. And he's asking, if, in the spirit of bipartisanship, who are some Republican members of the Senate that, uh, that you either admire or that you look forward to working with in order to find common, common ground to find solutions to these problems? Yes, so at a very young age, um, I was in my early 20s, as a Navy pilot going through flight school, there was one guy we really looked up to as a as as another naval aviator, and that was John McCain. Um, I mean, that was when I was in flight school in the 1980s. And then, you know, you often think about, you know, for folks who served in the military, you got to go to SEER school, and you think about, you know, what happens when you plan for this. What happens if you ever got shot down? He was the example of how you serve our country under a really challenging set of circumstances, a horrible situation. And then later to uh, meet him, get to know him one day, call him, uh, you know, a friend. Um, it was very important to me, you know, to, to, we often don't get to meet our heroes, right? And um, so I had the opportunity to do that. And I think he was a very good example of somebody who was able to put party and partisanship aside to work across the aisle, to make decisions that were in the best interest of our country and not necessarily in the best interest of politics or his party. So I always looked up to John McCain um, and, you know, I, 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 I uh, think he was a very good example of um, representing 
uh, a state in the United States Senate uh, in, in a really very honorable and independent way. So if I wind up um, in the United States Senate here in, uh, after this election, I'm gonna look across the aisle to build friendships. It was something my wife Gabby was, was really good, good about. I mean, she had um, her, one of her closest friends in the US House of Representatives was a guy named uh, Ted Poe. Ted Poe was a very conservative Republican from Texas. And Gabby and Ted were buddies and she, she didn't agree with him on everything but she was very fond of him and she worked, uh, they worked on some things together and I'll be looking for folks on the, you know, on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I have some relationships now, but I'll look to expand those if I'm given the opportunity. Thanks, Braden. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, you, you gave some great examples of some, uh, some national issues given the, the crisis that we have going on right now. Um, I know an issue that's near and dear to my heart here in the state of Arizona is the issue of, of water. And I, on a national level, um, Arizona is in a unique place as part of the lower Colorado uh, River system uh, for accessing water. This is going to be a, an issue in which the Arizona delegation is going to have to negotiate and work things out with, uh, with the, rest of, the rest of the country. Um, I just like your thoughts on that and kind of where you see the future of Arizona water and, and Arizona's role in in finding solutions to our, our water issues here in the state? Yeah, they're significant and uh, we've got to address them. Uh, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, if, if, if you pay attention to the, the water issue right now are below 50% capacity each. Now Lake Mead, the, the level in Lake Mead is, is subject to how much water re we release from Lake Powell, but both of those are under 50% right now. And we are part of the lower Colorado River Basin, you know, with California and, uh, and, and New Mexico, Nevada. Um, and we're gonna wind up here in the next year or so in what's called the drought contingency plan. That takes us out for six years. But when that happens because of the way uh, water rights for the lower Colorado River Basin, our water rights are subservient to, to other states. It was part of the negotiation when the Central Arizona project was built. So this was a deal that was made in the 1960s. So what happens is we're gonna to have to cut back before other states. And if we get into the drought contingency, we're gonna to have to cut back by 18% of the water we get from the Colorado River. Right now we get 39% of Arizona's water comes from the Colorado River. We're gonna to have to reduce that 39% by 18%. So we could do the math on how much less water that is. It's a significant amount of water. And because of the way the water rights are divvied up within the state, the, the, the county that has the worst impact is Pinal County, specifically Pinal County farmers. So they'll start pumping groundwater. They'll need to, to support their crops. So we've got these, these challenges that, that, that we face. And now I think the, the good thing is we have really good examples in, in, in our state of communities that have done really well with conserving water. And how do you address this problem? Yuma is a perfect example. I mean, Yuma has take, taken this seriously for decades now. In Yuma, they now grow more crops with significantly less water. So significantly more crops with a lot less water than they did in the 1980s because they take conservation very seriously. We need, a, we need to bring everybody together here before the year 2026 when the, the drought contingency plan 2026 is when we get to the Colorado River guidelines. We've got to bring all the stakeholders together, farmers, tribal nations, communities, uh, political leaders, and, and look for how are we going to tackle this as a state. I also think that long term, you know, our water issues here in the state are tied to you know, climate change. So we've got to tackle the issue of climate change. We can't wait a decade or two to do that. Thank you, Mark. Uh, if I could just jump in here, it, you know, CJ asked a, you know, as an Arizona and a very specific Arizona question, which is good. We we want those. Uh, I have a, a a higher level sort of almost a philosophical question for you. Yeah, I, I read your op-ed today, which you published on, um, you know, your intention to offer independent, unifying leadership, which I thought was really good. I encourage 
uh, everybody to, to read it on AZ Central. Um, but you know, you, you mentioned the economic crisis that has been created by the health crisis in our country. And you say that uh, partisan politics have made them worse. And then you go on to say, as you've mentioned here, that you, you believe in solving problems with, uh, in, in this piece with data and science. Um, you know, for shorthand, I might say truth and facts. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm intrigued by, by this, where you, you talk about how partisanship is making it difficult for us to solve problems. And you believe in solving problems with truth, with data, with facts. What's the relationship between those two things? When we become hyper-partisan, does that pull us away from truth and facts? And if so, why? And how does setting partisanship aside allow us uh, to start solving problems for the American people with the use of truth and science and, and facts? And it certainly resonates with me, that idea, because you know, I know someone like you, a, fighter, a former fighter pilot and astronaut, you're in harm's way, you're in life and death situations, and you just simply have to operate with truth, facts, and science. You don't have a choice. And so, you know, I think you have some special insights in the relationship between partisanship and the lack of truth and, and facts uh, used in solving problems and what happens when we set partisanship aside and, and somehow we're able to embrace truth more. How, how does that work? Well, I think I think it's first it's important to recognize that regardless of party and somebody's political background or leanings, we all generally have the same goals in mind for our country, right? We want our kids to be well educated. We want to have an economy uh, that is is growing, and folks, regardless of their background, can be successful. Uh, we want our country to be secure. Um, we want to be safe on our streets. I mean, all these things are, are almost, it's almost like it's universal, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, or independent. And it's often what, where we get into is the approach. You know, how do we get from where we are today to the ultimate goal? Um, because everybody wants prosperity, you know, and they, 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 and they will, everybody likes equality and opportunity. So how do you get there? And I think, you know, embracing reality is a, is a good first step. And that's where the data and the facts come in. And I often get frustrated when we, we, we see individuals, and this is, uh, this is on both sides of the aisle, offering, I, I hate to use the word alternative facts because somebody else used that, but, you, you know, stuff that isn't factual and isn't accurate. Uh, in my background, as an engineer, as a pilot, a commander of the space shuttle, as a test pilot especially, well, the space shuttle thing too. I mean, data and facts, there, there is no other, there's no other option. I mean, if you can't get the data right and you can't understand the data, you can't make good decisions. Um, and I see our government often making poor decisions because it injects partisanship and politics into things instead of looking at, okay, what's the data? Where are we trying to get? What are the goals? How do we get there? Leaving the, leaving the influence and the politics out. So I, I, I don't think I have a, a great solution. I think change is always good. I think diversity is good too. Uh, if elected to the US Senate, I'll, I think I'll be the only person there with a graduate degree in engineering. And I think I'm only one of two that has any degree in engineering. So from the standpoint of like on technical issues, it's something I've been doing my whole life. Maybe I can help convince folks that are often, you know, maybe they have their alternative set of facts and I can convince them that that isn't actually the way we should approach this. Um, but it is gonna be, I, I recognize it's, it's gonna be a challenge. And I also recognize that I don't have all the answers and all the solutions. And I think it's important for, um, the folks we elect to office, um, whether it's Congress or in state legislatures, that you elect people that don't that understand that they don't have all the answers. I think we wind up getting into into trouble with partisanship when everybody thinks they that their idea is the best, that they know the right thing to do, that they have the answer. I recognize that I don't have all the answers, and I'm willing to change my mind on things too. 
Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to approach this as like, Hey, let's, let's try to come up with a fact based and a database solution to the problems we face. Thank you. So um, I've been, I'll take a question actually from the, the audience. Um, they're asking what one of your goals would be for those under the poverty line, um, especially children with troubling or no family support. And you know, I'll editorialize that, that this is an in increasingly troubling issue amid the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, here in the state of Arizona, I don't know what the what what the uh, statistics are in other states, but right now we have 440,000 individuals, and many of them have families, and they're trying to get by on $240 a week of unemployment benefits. That's what the weekly benefit is here in the state of Arizona, and there were additional benefits that came from the federal government, but those expired months ago, and Congress, both parties have been unable to come to some agreement to try to provide some additional help. Uh, and those, those folks that are in that situation are now below the poverty line, far below the poverty line. And I've spoken to Arizonans who have had to make horrible choices about um, whether to pay the rent or fill a prescription or buy groceries for the week. I don't know if you've, if anybody's heard this before, but this, this, this saying that rent eats first meaning that you have to pay your rent. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna not buy groceries in order to pay your rent. And uh, we've got a lot of folks here in the state of Arizona, and I'm sure in every state across our country that are in, that is in this, this situation. So when you're in a crisis, you know, it's, this is like the master alarm is going off in the space shuttle. You gotta solve that problem first. And that is, We've got to solve the pandemic part of this, the public health crisis, and then we've got to solve the economic crisis. And I think in the short term, we have to support these families that through no fault of their own are now well under the poverty line. As we come out of this, you know, how do we, how do we help people you know, get to a situation, an economic situation that's more stable for their families? I think in, in a lot of cases, it, it, it's often about education and trying to level the playing field, trying to provide a good public education for every young person. Uh, I'd be an advocate to spend more in Title I funding you know, to help schools uh, be able to provide better education in certain areas of our country, and then provide economic opportunity. And there's a lot of ways that the, the government can do that. Following up on that, <clears throat> there's another viewer question, and I actually had the same one, which is, um, this is from Kath, Kathy Varga. You know, I think if you kind of look at it on the optimistic and through the optimistic lens, there's a lot of people who run for office and, and want to go to Washington to solve problems, but then they, they get there and, and they kind of run into to barriers to, to do so. Can you speak to kind of your, your thoughts and ideas for any kind of systemic changes or other changes that can be made to, to help lead? the intentions of uh, being a problem solver as opposed to being part of the problem. Yeah, I think, a, you know, there's a couple obvious things we could, we could do that I would be an advocate for that Senator John McCain was a big, big advocate for, and that was campaign finance reform. Getting the, the, uh, the unlimited spending from corporations, dark money out of our political system. Uh, he passed legis bipartisan legislation with Russ Feingold now, recently, over the years, that has been undone, and there was a Supreme Court decision, uh, Citizens United, that uh, basically undid the major pieces of that piece of legislation. So now corporations have the same political speech rights uh, as individuals, and I don't think that's healthy for our democracy. Um, so one of the things I did when I became a candidate for the United States Senate on the first day is I said I wasn't going to take any corporate PAC money because what I, I, I believe that if, if I'm elected and get a chance to serve in the United States Senate, um, I'm going to make decisions that is in the best interest of the American people and the best interest of Arizonans, not what's in the best interest of some company that may have happened to write me a, 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 a PAC check. Um, so I think campaign finance reform would really help. And then I think for the House of Representatives, uh, if we were able to address this issue of gerrymandering, 
congressional districts, House districts, and making them very safe for a specific Democrat or a specific Republican. The, the situation that creates is you basically hand a, a lifetime job to a politician uh, that all they have to do is be the most partisan person in their party if they have a heavily gerrymandered district, because then they will never lose a general election um, because it's gerrymandered. And if they're very partisan, they won't lose a primary either. Uh, so that's the situation we wind up in with a lot of House districts. There's 435 members of the, of the House of Representatives. And on average, there's only about 40 that are competitive. My wife, Gabby, was in a competitive district. Um, now she was a, just by her nature, was independent, was a moderate and always wanted to work across the aisle, uh, but she had to do that to be able to, to, be able to win a reelection and then win another reelection again. Uh, but that's not true for folks in these gerrymandered districts. So there is no incentive for them to compromise. So if we wanna to get to a point uh, where our Congress functions better, those two things, get the corporate money out of the political system and end the gerrymandering of House districts would, would be very, very helpful. So that brings up an interesting point in terms of the conversation about Arizona. Uh, if you were to be elected, you would be one of two Democratic senators representing our entire state. Um, to me, that represents an outstanding opportunity for bipartisanship in that you're representing a state that is roughly a third Republican, a third Democrat, and a third independent, um, which goes back to the, the maverick nature of, of John McCain. Can you tell us a little bit about how you envision yourself operating in that environment where you, you need to represent all of us? Well, first of all, I think it's important to, to recognize that two years ago, I was one of those registered independents, and I always voted for the person not voted for the party. Um, so my intention is to you know, represent all three of those thirds, Republicans, Democrats, and independents in the best way I possibly can and make decisions that are you know, not, you know, that, that aren't partisan, that aren't political. Hey, what is in the best interest of all of us here um, in our state and in the country? Um, you know, and, and I, I do know that folks often they get to Washington, D.C., they say one thing, they do another. I'm going to do the absolute best I can um, to, you know, represent all of Arizona in a very thoughtful and independent way, independent from big corporations, independent from political parties. You know, like I said up front, you know, this was not my lifetime dream to run for the United States Senate. I mean, I wanted to be the commander of the space shuttle and one day go to Mars. I wanted to fly airplanes off of an aircraft carrier. I got to do that. Uh, and then I took off the uniform. Uh, but eventually I realized that uh, just taking that uniform off doesn't mean public service is over, that our country is too important. Um, and it's also our democracy is, uh, is also rather fragile. I think we've seen that uh, over, the, over recent years. And, you know, I just felt I had to, you know, step up and, you know, try to do the best I can um, to, to help solve some of these problems we face. Mark, I've, I've got another question. I appreciate that. You know, so often I, I feel like we get caught in our, our partisan bubbles and in our partisan tribes uh, based on uh, issues that are extremely divisive. And we all know what they are. We could list them. But, you know, in, in your offering of, of leadership the way you are now and, and in talking to people around Arizona and, and nationally as well, um, have you seen any areas of unexpected common ground on divisive issues on, you know, whether it's, you know, it, it could be something, you know, very, very uh, pertinent to Arizona, like water, as CJ asked about, it could be a social issue, it could be a uh, you know, defense issue. Have you found any unexpected common ground where, where maybe other leaders, other leaders and other people haven't recognized it, but where you've seen it? Well, I, yeah, I think the uh, when you, here in Arizona, I know it's different in different states, but when you talk about water, we all get it. Democrats and Republicans understand the issue that we're facing. I mean, this is something that we that we need, and we need to come up with a solution. And um, I've I've seen you know strong bipartisanship there. 
Um, I think border security is the same, you know, similar issue for any border state. You know, we need borders. Um, now there are differences, you know, how, how is the best way, what's the best way to do this? But I think it's, a, it's an area where we both, you know, we, where we recognize that we do have an issue and we've got to apply, you know, some, some sort of approach uh, to it. And the, the approach might vary. Um, you know, I've seen even, you know, from this, the, from, from our president, you know, he talks about the, the high cost of prescription drugs. Um, I think we all realize that. And, you know, if, if, if I was elected to the United States Senate and, you know, President Trump was reelected, you know, that's an issue that I would want to work with him on because it affects so many families. And I've seen and I've heard from you know, especially seniors who tell me about how the price of their prescription medication has gone up. I mean, recently I was hearing about 300 percent in a year. I heard an example the other day where uh, the seniors medication went up by a factor of seven in one year, seven X, and couldn't pay for it anymore. And um, we need reforms in, in that system. I think Medicare should be allowed to negotiate the price of prescription drugs, but also reforms in the patent system. And I, I think the administration in the White House, you know, they, I think they realize that. So, you know, that's somewhere where I think there could be a lot of common ground. Thank you. This has been a tough for, you know, almost anybody. And, you know, the, the pandemic doesn't know party or, or partisanship. It's, it's just been a, a tough year. Uh, and it's a tough year for, for the country. What are some of the things that give you hope as you travel around Arizona across the country right now? Well, I would say it's, well, I haven't been traveling around the country much. Um, and look across, as, you can see yeah. from home. Yeah. But also not um, not much across the state um, this year, especially since March. Before that, I spent a lot of time on the road, meeting with a lot of folks. And I'd say the thing that gives me, you know, hope, a couple things. You know, one is. You know, I think folks realize that um, yeah, we're all in this together. And I realize that as a young pilot on the space shuttle, seeing the Earth for the first time from low Earth orbit, big round ball just floating there in the blackness of space. I mean, you really get this sense that we are all in this together. And I think, I think people get that. Um, they get frustrated with Washington. They often feel Washington's broken. I agree with them right now. We've got a crisis in leadership. Uh, we've got, we're facing a pandemic, the likes of which we haven't seen in a hundred years, more than a hundred years. Um, and these problems that we face are rather challenging uh, to solve. But here's what gives me hope. As a country, we, there is no country better at solving hard problems than the United States. When we decide we want to, we want to tackle something, we can figure it out. I mean, remember, we're the country that sent people to the moon in the 1960s. I mean, think about how crazy that was. Uh, we can do hard things. We just have to realize that it's not one party that can do it. It's not Democrats. It's not Republicans. It's not independents. Um, I think anything that is hard to solve, no single party can do it. But if we're willing to come together and work as a team, we can fix anything. So that gives me a lot of hope. And I, also, I often feel that from Arizonans as I traveled across and spent a lot of time on the road last year, especially, that people get that. And they know, um, they, they know that the United States of America is a special place. We got the smartest scientists and engineers, the best universities. Um, we also have an approach. And, and I realized this from a lot of the work I did with um, on the space shuttle with we, we, we had a lot of partners on the International Space Station. So um, we would do things as a team, but when it was always interesting to me that the, the approach that we take as Americans, it's about, there, there's one thing that comes first for us that's not universal. It does not extend to other countries. Um, we are driven by the mission, by accomplishing the goal. That comes first, you know, for us. Uh, when we decide to do it, 
if we can get the politics and the partisanship out, we are a very mission driven country. Um, and that gives me a, a tremendous amount of hope. On, on that same lines of mission, um, if you were going, you're going into a hostile territory, shall we say, and uh, you may not know who your friends are, you may not know too many people, you may not have been directly in that environment. Um, how do you, uh, how, how do you get the mission done and what are your first priorities for, for making inroads and, and getting the long-term job done? Well, I've been over hostile territory before uh, in an airplane. I mean, I almost got shot down a bunch of times over Iraq. I had a F-6 missile blow up next to my airplane once. Um, so I've, I, I've had that experience, but you know, then you know who, you're, who the enemy is. I don't look at this as the same, right? I look at this going to the United States Senate. We're all on the same team. I mean, we might have our differences, but we're gonna we're gonna try to figure this out and try to bring people together. Uh, we've got common goals. We all want the same outcome. It's it's just what the what the approach is. So I'm, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, I'm gonna go in there with a very positive attitude that this is about teamwork and working across the aisle. And you know, hopefully, I can I can be a part of uh, trying to get us back on a better traje trajectory. You know, I know a little bit about trajectories and the, and the one we're on right now, I'm not so sure it's sustainable. So I'm, I'm hoping to help, you know, do, do a little orbit adjust burn and get us right back on the, on the correct trajectory. Thank you, Mark. You know, I've, I've got a, a bit of a personal question to ask you. I hope you won't mind it. You know, in, in uh, my preparation for this conversation, I talked to a number of people, Republicans actually, who have observed you over the years in Arizona. And, uh, you know, several of them said without prompting, uh, they, they commented on um, the love and respect you demonstrate for your wife and for former Congress, Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. And, you know, I, again, this is a bit personal, but I think it's so important that over the last four years, many women, many Republican women or right-leaning independent women, you know, have felt so disrespected and maligned by, by some of our leaders. And, you know, that's caused them to sort of wonder where they fit politically, uh, where they fit in the country. Um, and, and then to hear so many people without prompting talk about how you demonstrate such love and respect for, for your wife. It just, you know, it was, it was such a contrast from so much of what we've been seeing over the last couple of years. And I think is important because it really speaks to the, the fundamental equal value of, of all. And we know that, you know, women have been maligned over the last four years. We know that people have been attacked based on, you know, their religion and the color of their skin and even their lives put at risk. And so I think all of these things are related. But when I, I heard that again, I, I, I was just touched that I was hearing it so often. And I just wonder if you wouldn't maybe tell us more, speak more about, about your wife uh, and, and your relationship, if you would, and, and then really about your, your view of, of the value of, of people, no matter who they are, what they believe, et cetera. Yeah, well, so... Um... I talked a little bit about my mom earlier, right? My mom yeah. was incredibly strong and independent, did things that were unexpected, right? Became a police officer in our town in West Orange, New Jersey, when there were no other women. A woman has never done that before. Um, and, you know, my mom is somebody that really motivated me to, to, to try to do hard things and try to accomplish hard goals. And then I met Gabby and I saw a lot of, you know, similar you know, qualities uh, in Gabby, doesn't take no for an answer, uh, works incredibly hard. I think she works harder than any member of, of Congress that I knew of. Um, it was just just the the amount of stuff that she could pack into a day was, was just incredible. And then to watch what she went through after she was nearly assassinated, she was shot in the head from three feet away with a nine millimeter round and was in the hospital for six months, was in another outpatient rehab for a year after that, rarely complained. Um, you know, she just would talk about, you know, 
just the future, move ahead, she would say. We gotta move ahead, we've got stuff to do, we've gotta accomplish uh, whatever the goal is. Um, I mean, she's the toughest person I have ever met. Uh, and I have tremendous respect for her and what she went through. And then to, to try to make a, try to continue to make a difference uh, in the world and never complain about it and never give up. Um, so she's, you know, she's like my inspiration to, to even, you know, consider running for uh, public office. Because when you think about what, you know, Gabby went through and what our family went through, and it's obviously connected to her service, she was at work when she was injured. You know, you, would, you, would, you might think that folks would just say, hey, you know, I've had enough of that. Well, that's certainly not in my DNA. And it is definitely not in my wife, Gabby's DNA. I mean, she'd be the first person, I mean, you know, out there on, you know, she'd be on the front line of any, any battle, despite the, uh, the challenges that she currently faces. Um, so she, she's like, she's an inspiration for, for me uh, and for so many other folks around the country. Um, and it's uh, very unfortunate for what happened, you know, what happened to her. And those other individuals, you know, six individuals that died that day, uh, including uh, Christina Taylor Green and 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 others, and twelve other people injured, and then Gabby. Um, but you know, Gabby is 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 uh, you know just works so hard every single day to try to make a difference. You know, works on her rehabilitation, um, and um, just wants to be you know wants to be part of the solution here and helpful. Thank you. Mark, one, one question from the Arizona contingent out here, and uh, that's what, what can the country learn from, uh, from Arizona and its people? What, what do you plan on taking from here to Washington, and what lessons do you, do you anticipate sharing with, with those around you? Well, I think the, the one thing that makes, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that makes our Arizona special and unique, but I, I think it's like the history of, you know, independence and working across the aisle. I mean, we're the state of Barry Goldwater and John McCain and Gabby Giffords. Um, and I think other states can take a lesson uh, from, from us here uh, in Arizona. And I, I hope to bring that, uh, you know, and it's, it's by far the best place I've ever lived. I mean, nothing, nothing comes as a, as a, as a close second. Um, Not so, even the space station? Wait a second. You know, the space station is good for, for a couple of weeks. That's about it. You don't want to live on the space station forever. You don't want to live on the space station for a year like my brother did. Yeah. Uh, that you, you, you talk about like water issues and other issues. Um, living in space, you, I mean, you think we have water problems here in Arizona? Um, the water on the space station, you're recycling it, like all of it. So, you know, the stuff that, that goes through you. Uh, I think I know what that means. <laughs> yeah, you're drinking it again. So. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I hope to, to, to bring, uh, you know, the, the special parts of Arizona to the U.S. Senate if I get the opportunity. That was the ultimate and you think you have it bad. So uh, I, I definitely can't one up that. Uh. I'm curious your thoughts, um, just to expand more, you know, we talk a lot about how there's not enough bipartisan cooperation and friendship and uh, you know, working across the aisle uh, these days, especially when compared to looking back, you know, even in presidencies 10, 20 years ago, that you know, we've just really been polarizing even more over the last decade. But, um, you know, the, the problem with polarization and division, and it goes beyond our leaders. And we have a couple of people asking about what people can do just among their friends and their family and in their communities um, to engage in kind of more, more civil dialogue and, and debate at a time where many are finding that pretty difficult. I think you gotta, I think it should be on all of us to, to look for opportunities to build relationships with folks that don't think exactly like we do. Um, I embrace those friendships in, in, in my life um, I have friends that are, uh, you know, politically think about things like totally differently than I do. 
And those relationships are some of the, the most important ones to me. Um, and I, 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 I make sure that I maintain them. Um, and, you know, I, I also think that like the world we live in today makes this harder in some ways. Social media makes it harder. You know, Twitter and Facebook, they're, they're incredible tools for communication. Um, so they're really important. But at the same time, it does tend to promote divisiveness uh, in society. And I think people just have to, you know, take, take this stuff with, um, you know, a little humility maybe and a little bit like don't hold grudges. You know, in politics, you see like politicians will often be, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, that's certainly not in my nature. I mean, if there's somebody, you know, in the United States Senate that has said some bad stuff about me, I'm not going to care when I get there at all. Um, I'll try to, you know, have the best relationship with all other 99 U.S. senators if, if I happen to be uh, elected to this office here in a, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. So I think uh, I think what many of us are hearing now is that you you have a, a strong intent to reach across the aisle uh, if if you're called upon to serve. Which uh, coming from a military background, I I certainly appreciate that, and and we see that. But it's it's often difficult when you're you're you have to choose a party when you're running in this country. Um, what risk do you run by by no longer being independent? Uh, as you said, you were two years ago, and do you still feel that you can remain independent even though you're you're now attached to a political party? Yeah, I mean, you are right, and you also have a voting record, right? When you start voting on things, and you've got to make decisions based on, hey, what do I think is in the best interest of the state and 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 the country? And somebody can attach a label to that. I get that, you know, I to I I totally do, and. Um, uh, you know, I always I always find it very interesting how they, you know, say members vote with the party, you know, this percentage of the time. Um, you know, I saw that with Gabby, but with the other members, you're voting with your party this percentage of the time. I think people often don't realize a lot of those votes are like naming the post office. Right. And and everybody votes the same way. It's like 100 percent of the people voted. Yes. Um, so that that aside, I mean, I'm just going to do my best to reach across the aisle, to not be beholden to the political party, to do what's in the best interest of our state and our country, to make decisions based on science and data and facts, not dismiss the science, not dismiss um, opinions. You know, I'll be looking for, I also realize I don't, you know, have all the answers. So I'm gonna be looking for, you know, input um, from both sides of the aisle or both sides, you know, of the political, all sides of the political spectrum. Oh, thank you for that answer. I think that's uh, that, that's important to hear from from sitting out here. But I think on a national level, uh, people appreciate hearing that too. And it's uh, it's it's tough um, when you don't have a voting record for for people to to trust that statement uh, as, as it's coming out. And so uh, we look forward to. Uh, to, to seeing seeing how things go and and uh, seeing where your your trajectory takes you. So I know we're I know we're closing in on on the end of time, and there will be some some questions out there. But given uh, given your time uh, around talking with people in Arizona, I know you felt the the divisions among this country. What have you been doing to help bridge those divisions uh, among the people, not just uh, the people in the populations in the cities here? And the counties across Arizona, what what have you been doing to communicate and try to bridge those those relationships on a personal level, not necessarily at the political level, uh, nation nationally? Well, I mean, a personal level, I'm, I'm reaching out to uh, groups and individuals from all different backgrounds, and it's hard for me to say the word, you know, that it's not political, but say Republicans. So I I reach out to and get a lot of advice from Republicans in Arizona. Uh, and independents and Democrats. So I'm trying to bridge that political gap, but also with organizations, you know, business organizations, chambers of commerce, um, who often would support my, my opponent, which is fine. Um, and, you know, but that, that I, I, I still value uh, the opinion of these, these organizations that are trying to, 
you know, help businesses and try to create good paying jobs and, and support our economy. So um, it doesn't matter to me, you know, if an organization has, you know, supported somebody else in the past, uh, I'm still going to look for uh, their help when, when I need it to do the job of a United States Senator if I'm elected. That's great. Thank you so much for, for sharing all the, all the insight that you have. And uh, I know it's a unique experience for all of us sitting here. I think it's a great opportunity for, for us. I think we've, been, uh, we've, we've got a great attendance here. And I know a number of people have reached out to me to, to say they're going to be viewing this later. Um, I know, uh, is, is there anything else that you would like to share with us in terms of a message that, that you think we should take with us to, to our audience and our community? Well, I think it's, uh, I, th I think what you guys are doing is great. And uh, I know you've been at it for a while and it all makes, it all helps, right? It makes any time we can try to foster relationships across the aisle and uh, bring some more independence to our politics. I think that's a, that, that's a good thing. Um, I, I think the message, you know, for your supporters out there is that from, you know, my perspective, what you're doing is the kind of thing that really helps make our democracy stronger. Um, and especially now in a time we really need it. So please, please keep it up, keep working hard. It really matters. Uh, it makes a difference. I know in, you know, in, in government and politics, it often seems that, uh, you know, change does often take a long time, but eventually we can also make these like step function, you know, changes at a, at a given time. Um, and, and the focus that you're taking, I think is the right one. And I really appreciate that you, Mindy and Evan and CJ, you're, you're, you're taking this approach. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. It's, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you. And as CJ mentioned, you know, we've, we've got, um, you know, a lot of people tuning in and appreciating now and, and, and uh, a lot of people who will see this after the fact, and we'll be sending it out to, um, our stand up public members across the country and in Arizona. And uh, I think many, many will be encouraged by your unifying approach to leadership. We certainly need it now. You know, we need leadership based on, on facts, based on science and data, as you put it. Uh, no one better than a former combat pilot and NASA astronaut to, uh, to lead, the, lead the charge with, with facts and data and science. Uh, in our national leadership, I, um, so I, I appreciate your being here and talking to us, and and uh, for your your voice out there and, and everything you're doing and your approach to helping the country through uh, such a challenging time. Well, thank you, thank you, Evan, CJ, Mindy, thank you so much for having me join you today. Thank you so much, and just final words. I'm sure everyone joining doesn't need this message, which is make sure you vote. Cast, cast those ballots. It's such an important civic duty. We're heartened to see uh, kind of record turnout across the country, it appears. Uh, you may not need that message, but please, in these final days, this is the time to encourage your friends and your family to, to do their civic duty and, and cast those ballots in such, a, such an important year and time for our country. Thank you again for joining us, and, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you.